Chapter Two of Child Life in Colonial Days by Alice Morse Earl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Children's Dress Quote, Man's earthly interests are all hooked and buttoned together and held up by clothes from sartor resartus thomas carlyle eighteen thirty three of the dress of infants of colonial times we can judge from the articles of clothing which have been preserved till this day perhaps i should say that we can judge of the better garments worn by babies not their everyday dress for it is not their simpler attire that has survived but their christening robes their finer shirts and petticoats and caps linen form the chilling substructure of their dress thin linen low-necked short-sleeved shirts and linen even formed the underwear of infants until the middle of this century these little linen shirts are daintier than the warmest silk or fine woolen underwear that have succeeded them they are edged with fine narrow thread lace hem stitched with tiny rows of stitches and sometimes embroidered by hand i have seen a little shirt and a cap embroidered with the coat of arms of the lux and johnson families and the motto god bless the babe these delicate garments were worn in infancy by the revolutionary soldier governor johnson of virginia in the essex institute in salem massachusetts are the baptismal shirt and mittens of the pilgrim father william bradford second governor of the plymouth colony who was born in fifteen ninety all are of firm close woven homespun linen but the little mittens have been worn at the ends by the active friction of baby hands and are patched with colored chinny or calico a similar colored material frills the sleeves and neck a pair of baby mitts of fine lace also may be seen at the essex institute these are wrought in the sixteenth century and the stitches and work are those of the antique flanders laces i have seen many tiny mitts knit of silk and mittens of fine linen hem stitch worked in drawn work or embroidered and edged with thread lace and also a few mitts of yellow nankeen which must have proved specially irritating to the tiny little hands that wore them i have never seen a woolen petticoat that was worn by an infant of pre-revolutionary days it may be argued that woolen garments being liable to ruin by moths would naturally not be treasured this argument scarcely is one of force because i have been shown infants cloaks of wool as well as woolen garments for older folk that have been successfully preserved also beautifully embroidered long cloaks of chamois skin i think infants wore no woolen petticoats their shirts petticoats and gowns were of linen or some cotton stuff like dimity 
warmth of clothing was given by tiny shawls pinned round the shoulders and heavier blankets and quilts and shawls in which baby and petticoats were wholly enveloped the baby dresses of olden times are either rather shapeless sacks drawn in at the neck with narrow cotton ferret or linen bobbin or little straight-waisted gowns of state all were exquisitely made by hand usually a fine stuff but the babies in pioneer settlements a century ago had to share in wearing homespun it is told of one in a log cabin in a new hampshire clearing that when the grandmother rode out eighty miles on horseback to see her son's first baby she shed bitter tears at beholding the child but a few months old clad in a gray woolen homespun slip with an apron or tire of blue and white checked linen the mother a frontier lass dressed the infant according to the fashions she was accustomed to nothing could show so fully the costume of children in olden times as their portraits and a series of such portraits of successive dates will be given in these pages many of them are asserted to be by the three well-known artists of colonial days blackburn smibbert and copley a few are by peel trumbull and stuart i have accepted all family traditions as true and in many cases believe them to be true especially since there were few painters of any rank in the community and no others who could paint portraits such as those which have been preserved the gilbert stuarts and trumbulls usually have some authentic pedigree many of these pictures have no artist's signature and are absolutely valueless as works of art and probably meritless as likenesses but as records of costume they are always of interest and historical worth there is a certain sweetness in some of these old-time portraits they are stiff and flat but some of them have a quaintness that reminds me of the angels of the early florentine painters they have little grace of figure but the details of costume make them pleasing even if they are not beautiful the first child's portrait in this series is one of extraordinary interest it is opposite page four and has never before been given to the public it is the reputed miniature of the pilgrim father governor edward winslow when a boy about six years of age which would be in sixteen o two it is the only miniature in existence of any of the pilgrims at any age i have in deference to the wishes of the rev dr william copley winslow of boston to whom i am indebted for it entitled it the reputed miniature of the child edward winslow though the term expresses neither his belief nor mine and seems scarcely just to a portrait whose claim to authenticity are far more definite than those of many of the family portraits that have descended to us the miniature came to dr winslow from mrs hersheep of pembroke massachusetts she died at the age of eighty-six her grandfather assured her that his father the famous general john winslow received the likeness from his father 
the grandson of edward the pilgrim and that it was the pilgrim's likeness as a child this through long-lived winslow's is a record of few retellings and these were told by folk to be trusted the winslows were gentlefolk of ample means such as were likely to have miniatures painted and the portrait of governor winslow when fifty-six years of age now in pilgrim hall plymouth is the sole one save this miniature of any of the pilgrims other strong evidence is the extraordinary resemblance of the child's picture to the grown-up portrait the same brow contour of face and other similarity there is something in the child's portrait that is singularly suggestive to any one with any historical imagination the simplicity of the dress and the arrangement of the hair show the influence of puritanism as i look at it i can fancy yes i can plainly see some little english children twenty years later standing on that crowded historic ship looking back with childish serenity at the home they were leaving and then greeting as cheerfully and trustingly the sad plymouth where they disembarked and the faces that i see have the broad brow the flowing hair the bared neck and the simple dress shown in this miniature the next portrait which faces the title page shows the costume worn in sixteen ninety by a boy a year or two old it is a charming and quaint picture of the first john quincy who was born in sixteen eighty nine and who when dying in seventeen sixty seven gave his name to his great-grandson john quincy adams who had just been born some have thought the picture that of a sister esther quincy but to me it has a hard little boy's face not the features of a delicate girl and also a boy's hands and a boy's toy children in america if gentle folk dress just as children did in england at that date and the boys wore coats in england till they were six or seven one of the most charming of all grandmother's letters was written by a doting english grandmother to her son lord chief justice north telling of the leaving off of coats of his motherless little son francis guilford then six years old the letter is dated october tenth sixteen seventy nine dear son you cannot believe the great concern that was in the whole family here last wednesday it being the day that the tailor was to help to dress little frank in his breeches in order to the making an everyday suit by it never had any bride that was to be dressed upon her wedding night more hands about her some the legs and some the arms the tailor buttoning and others putting on the sword and so many lookers on that had i not a finger amongst i could not have seen him when he was quite dressed he acted his part as well as any of them for he desired he might go down to inquire for the little gentleman that was there the day before in a black coat and speak to the man to tell the gentleman 
when he came from school that there was a gallant with very fine clothes and a sword to have waited upon him and would come again upon sunday next but this was not all there was great contrivings while he was dressing who should have the first salute but he said if old joan had been here she should but he gave it to me to quiet them all they were very fit everything and he looks taller and prettier than in his coats little charles rejoiced as much as he did for he jumped all the while about him and took notice of everything i went to bury and bought everything for another suit which will be finished on saturday so the coats are to be quite left off on sunday i consider it is not yet term time and since you could not have the pleasure of the first sight i resolved you should have a full relation from your most affectionate mother a north when he was dressed he asked buckle whether muffs were out of fashion because they had not sent him one this affectionate letter written to a great and busy statesman the lord keeper of the seals shows how pure and delightful domestic life in england could be but the writer was not a commonplace woman she was the mother of fourteen children and had had years of experience with a father-in-law before whom an army of traditional mothers-in-law would pale she lived through this ordeal and a trying marital experience and her children rose up and called her blessed among her virtues her son roger dilated at length upon her delightful letter-writing her freedom of style and matter and declared that her letters were among the comforts of her children's lives to return to the dress of john quincy with the exception of the neck of the body of the frock it is much like the dress of grown women of that day we have existing portraits of madame shimpton and rebecca rawson of the same date in both of these as in this little boy's portrait the sleeve is the most noticeable feature with its single slash double puff drawn in below the elbow and confined with pretty ribbon knots the sleeve was known as the virago sleeve and john quincy's are darker colored than his frock all three wear loosely tied rather shapeless hoods such as are seen on the women in the prince of the coronation procession of king william the boy has a close cap under his hood his dress is certainly picturesque and distinctive a portrait facing page thirty six of another massachusetts boy contemporary with john quincy is that of robert gibbs the rich boston merchant this is plainly marked as being painted when he was four and a half years old and with the date sixteen seventy he wears the same stiff cuirass as john quincy the same odd truncated shoes of buff leather and has the same masculine swing of the petticoats both figures stand on a checkerboard floor four squares deep with their toes at the same point on the board robert gibbs wears a more boyish collar or band as befits a bigger boy the sleeves are an important feature of his dress having a pair of long hanging sleeves bordered with fur which do not show in the print in this book but are plainly visible in the original portrait 
hanging sleeves were so distinctively the dress of a little child that the term had at that time a symbolic significance implying childishness both of youth and second childhood pepys thus figuratively employs the term judge sewell wrote in old age to a brother whose widowed sister he desired to marry quote, i remember when i was going from school at newbury to have some time met your sisters martha and mary in hanging sleeves coming home from their school in chandler's lane and have had the pleasure of speaking to them and i could find it in my heart now to speak to mrs martha again now i myself am reduced to hanging sleeves unquote. this roundabout wooing came to naught the judge married widow mary gibbs relict of this very robert gibbs whose childish portrait we have here the artist who painted this picture may have been tom child who is named by judge sewell as the portrait painter of that day a demure and quaint portrait opposite page forty two is that of jane boner she was born in sixteen ninety one the daughter of captain john boner of boston and was married in seventeen ten to john ellery she was about eight or ten years old when the portrait was painted crude as is the painting it gives evident proof that the lace of the stomacher and sleeve frills is of the nature of what is now called rose point in the early settlements of connecticut massachusetts and virginia sumptuary laws were passed to restrain an attempt to prohibit extravagance in dress the new england magistrates were curiously minute in description of over-luxurious attire and many offenders were tried and fined but vain daughters and sons quote, persisted in flaunting unquote, though ministers joined the lawmakers in solemn warnings and reprehensions young girls were fined for silk hoods and immoderate great sleeves and boldly appeared in court in still richer attire the dutch never attempted or wished to simplify the dress of either men or women in new york dress was ample substantial varied in texture and variegated in color it ever formed a considerable item in personal property the children of the dutch settlers had plentiful and warm clothing and sometimes very rich clothing as may be seen in the quaint and interesting picture facing page twenty six of twin girls the two daughters of abraham the peaster of new york and his wife margaret van cortland they are dressed in red velvet train gowns but are barefooted they were born december third seventeen twenty four and eva died in seventeen twenty nine a month after the portrait was painted catherine was married on her eighteenth birthday to john livingstone son of the second lord of the manor their son had a daughter catherine who became the wife of don mariano velaquez de la candidas to their daughters mrs azoy and miss mariana velaquez this interesting portrait now belongs the mother of these twins was the daughter of jacobus van cortland and eva de fries phillips the names of eva and catherine have ever been given to the little daughters of these allied families 
and are borne to-day by many of their descendants another little girl of dutch blood was kathalina post who married zigor van santboord her portrait was painted in seventeen fifty when she was fourteen years old and is now owned by dr van santboord of kingston on hudson new york a copy of this quaint old picture faces page two o four it is most interesting in costume the headgear showing distinct dutch influence there is a suggestion of earrings in this portrait and catherine ten Broek, another child of dutch blood but three years old wears earrings the reproduction of her portrait given opposite page one hundred ninety two shows these jewels but dimly but they are visible in the original oil painting she was born in albany in seventeen fifteen the portrait is marked etat sua three years seventeen nineteen she was married to john livingstone and lived to become a stately old dame receiving formally on new year's day her grandchildren who always greeted her in dutch learned for the special occasion the devastations of two wars and in some localities three destruction by fire and earthquake have sadly destroyed the cherished relics of many southern homes from mrs st julian ravenel of charleston south carolina the delightful biographer of that delightful colonial dame eliza lucas pickney come two portraits of children of the huguenot settlers the picture facing page forty eight of eleanor cords of st john's berkeley county south carolina painted about seventeen forty shows a lovely little child of french features and french daintiness of dress albeit a bright yellow brocaded satin would seem rather gorgeous attire for a girl but two years old opposite page fifty is a picture of daniel ravenel of one to st john's berkeley county south carolina who was born in seventeen sixty and was about five years old when this portrait was painted though he still wears what might be termed a frock with petticoats there is a decided boyishness in the waistcoat with its silver buttons and lace and the befrogged overcoat with broad cuffs and wrist ruffles and a turned-over reavers and narrow linen inner collar it is an exceptionally pleasing boy's dress for a little child two portraits of flag children painted it is said by smibert must be among his latest portraits for the baby polly flag was born in boston in seventeen fifty and smibert died in seventeen fifty one the portrait facing page one eighty four shows as may be seen a dear little baby not a year old in baby dress and cap clasping a toy it is marked on the back mrs polly heard for the little girl lived to be the wife and widow of dr wilder of lancaster massachusetts and of dr hurd of concord massachusetts of equal interest is the severely beautiful face of james flagg her brother shown opposite page one eighty eight he was born in seventeen thirty nine and was still coats when this portrait was painted these portraits are owned by mrs albert thorndyke of boston massachusetts the great-granddaughter of griselda apthorpe flag the sister of these two children the portrait of jonathan montfort given opposite page fifty eight 
has a special interest to the art student since it is a specimen of copley's early work the boy was born december sixth seventeen forty six and was seven years old when the portrait was painted he married mary bowl a newfoundland girl whose father sent her to a school in halifax under the charge of captain shepherd of medford massachusetts finding halifax in a state of blockade the captain took the little girl to boston he and his wife were childless and became deeply attached to her and finally adopted her she became engaged to dr monfort and went to visit her parents in ireland whither they had removed on her return bringing with her the gifts wardrobe and household furnishings of a bride of that period she came into boston harbor only to be wrecked in sight of the town the ship's mate swam with her to the lighthouse and the two were the only ones saved captain shepherd gave her a house and fresh outfit and she married dr monfort they had seven children but the name of monfort is now extinct their daughter elizabeth married major thomas pitts whose daughter is now mrs farlan of detroit michigan the present owner of this interesting portrait an altogether charming group of children facing page fifty four two sisters and two brothers of governor christopher gore seventh governor of massachusetts was painted about the year seventeen fifty four by copley the mature little girl of this picture frances mary thomas crafts colonel of the regiment of which paul revere was lieutenant colonel in the revolution colonel and mrs crafts were the great-grandparents of the present owners miss julia g robbins and miss susan p b robbins this picture was for a time in the boston museum of art and on returning it general loring wrote i shall miss the little grown-ups were there no children in those days this look of maturity seems universal to all these portraits i have photographs of several other groups of children one of the most charming that of the grimes children now in the capital at richmond virginia but they are all too darkened with age to admit a proper or adequate reproduction and must be left out of these pages the baby in the grimes group is truly a baby not a grown-up the handsomest of all the boys portraits of colonial days is that of samuel pemberton by blackburn it is perfect in feature and expression though he is but twelve years old he wears a wig it was painted in seventeen thirty six and the boys of good family then wore costly wigs mr freeman of portland maine had in his book of expenses of the year seventeen fifty such items as these shaving my three sons at sundry times five pounds fourteen shillings expenses for james wig nine shillings expenses for samuel's wig nine shillings the three sons samuel james and william were aged eleven nine and seven years the shaving was of their heads slaves of fashion were parents of that day to bedeck their boys with such rich wigs a more exquisite portrait than that of thomas aston coffin opposite page two twenty two can scarcely be found it is painted in copley's best manner shown in the highest perfection in the portrait of his daughter elizabeth 
a light hued satin petticoat front shows under a rich full skirted satin overdress which brushes the ground the pretty satin sleeves have white undersleeves and wrist ruffles but the neck is cut very low and round the child holds two pigeons by a leash and a feathered hat is by his side this portrait was much loved by its late owner miss anne s robbins of boston this charming picture of the pepperell children facing page two fourteen was believed to be by copley and included in mr perkins list at present this authorship is doubted it is owned by miss alice longfellow of cambridge having been bought by her father the poet from the owner of the portsmouth museum who had in some singular way acquired it the children are william son of the second sir william pepperell and his sister elizabeth royal pepperell who married reverend henry hutton a bright-eyed little girl mary lord has her portrait given opposite page sixty six hanging in the rooms of the connecticut historical society she was born in seventeen o two in hartford connecticut and married in seventeen twenty four colonel joseph pitkin of hartford by her side hangs the picture of colonel wadsworth and his son shown opposite page three hundred sixteen it is the one which the artist trumbull took to sir joshua reynolds for advice and comment he was snubbed with the snappish criticism that the coat looked like bent tin other criticism might be made on the anatomical proportions of the subjects copley's genius is shown in the fine portrait of william verstel facing page two hundred ten painted in seventeen sixty nine there is one little glimpse of this boy's boyhood which has so human an element and is so fully in touch with modern life that i give it it is from an old letter written by his mother during a visit in boston where possibly this very portrait was painted it shows the beginning of taste which found ample scope in his services in the war of the revolution boston june eleventh seventeen sixty six my dear these leaves me and my friends as i hope they will find you for help i was obliged to stay a fortnight as i didn't set out till the middle of the week from weathersfield was obliged to tarry here a fortnight on account of coming with the post we got down safe we got into boston wednesday afternoon at four o'clock the horse seemed to enter boston as free and fresh as when he first set out from home mr louder says he is a prime horse he wasn't galled or fretted in the least but it would have come right back again i was a good deal worried as billy didn't fill the chaise no more the horse might have brought three as well as two and not have felt it i have had but very little comfort since i have been here on account of billy as there's so much powder work going on among the children since the illumination billy has been very forward of firing iron guns since we've been here it's not only the powder amongst the children but the wharves being so near he's down there continually john bradford and ned and dan warner and billy was down the wharf together when a boy pushed dan over and liked to been drowned and might been billy so i can't take much comfort on leaving of him but shall bring him you needn't be concerned about threes coming up as mr hyde tells me billy may ride behind him if he's a mind to 
Billy became a portrait painter himself and got four guineas apiece for his miniatures. He early showed artistic predilections, and these tastes were well supplied. Interspersed with pumps and hose and hats for Billy are found in his father's purchases, brass dividers, scales, books for lining, two dozen hair pencils, and one box painter's colors on glass, which cost twelve shillings. I don't know who taught Billy limning. There was a funny book in circulation among students in that day. It was written in serious intent, but its rules read as though they were dictated by Oliver Herford. It was entitled, Every Young Man's Companion in Drawing. Here are a few of its instructions to young artists. Make your outlines, which may be mended occasionally. From the elbow to the root of the little finger is two noses. The thumb contains a nose. The inside of arm to middle of arm is four noses. The crowning glory of the Copley portraits is the charming family group opposite page 180, depicting Copley himself, his beautiful wife, his dignified father-in-law, and his lovely children. It is now exhibited in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. This group seems perfect, and the quaint figure of the child Elizabeth Copley in the foreground is worthy the brush of Van Dyke. Colonel John Lewis, one of the old Virginia gentlemen, had two child wards, as befitted young gentlefolk of that day of opulence and extravagance. They had their dress from England. In 1736, when Robert Carter, the younger child, was about nine years old, suits of fine holland, laced, and of red worsted, and of green German serge, came across seas for him, with laced hats, with loops and buttons. When he was twelve years old, part of his winter clothes were six pairs of shoes and two of pumps, four pair of worked hose and four of thread hose, gloves, hats, and shoe buckles. His sister Betty had a truly fashionable wardrobe, and the stiff, restrictive dress of the times was indicated by the items of stays, hoops, masks, and fans. When Miss Custis was but four years old, George Washington ordered for her from England pack thread stays, stiffened coats, a large number of gloves and masks. An order for purchases sent to a London agent by Washington in 1761 contains a full list of garments for both his stepchildren. Miss Custis was then six years old. These are some of the items. One coat made of fashionable silk, a fashionable cap or fillet with bib apron, ruffles and tuckers to be laced, four fashionable dresses made of long lawn, two fine cambric frocks, a satin capuchin hat and neckatees, a Persian quilted coat, one pair pack thread stays, four pair calamanco shoes, six pair leather shoes, two pair satin shoes with flat ties, six pair fine cotton stockings, four pair white worsted stockings, twelve pair mitts, six pair white kid gloves, one pair silver shoe buckles, one pair neat sleeve buttons, six handsome egrets, different sorts, six yards ribbon for egrets, twelve yards coarse green calamanco. There is a large-headed portrait of the Custis children 
which was painted at about this time a copy of it is shown opposite page two fifty while the dress of both children is mature it is not so elegant as might be expected from the rich garments which were imported for them sir william pepperell ordered in seventeen thirty seven equally costly and formal clothing from england for his little daughter to disport at piscataqua stays and masks are ever on the list of little gentlewomen a letter of the day tells of seeing the youthful daughter of governor tryon sitting stiffly in a chair in broad lace collar with heavy dress never playing running or even walking delicacy of figure and whiteness of complexion were equal fetishes with colonial mamas little dolly payne afterward dolly madison wore long gloves a linen mask and had a sunbonnet sewed on her head every morning by her devoted mother very thin shoes of silk morocco or light stuff unfitted little girls for any very active exercise these were high-heeled a tiny pair of shoes for a little girl of three are shown on page fifty one i have seen children's stays made of heavy strips of board and steel tightly wrought with heavy buckram or canvas into an iron frame like an instrument of torture these had been worn by a little girl five years old staymakers advertise stays jumps gazettes costrels and cossets these were doubtless corsets for ladies and children to make them appear straight quote unquote and i have been told of tin corsets for little girls but i have never seen any such abominations one pair of stays was labeled as having been worn by a boy when five years old there certainly is a suspicious suggestion in some of these little fellows portraits of whalebone and buckram in the sprightly description given by anna green winslow of her own dress we see with much distinctness the little girl of twelve of the year seventeen seventy one i was dressed in my yellow coat my black bib and apron my pompadour shoes the cap my aunt stora some time since presented me with blue ribbons on it a very handsome locket in the shape of a heart the paste pin my honored papa presented me within my cap my new cloak and bonnet on my pompadour gloves and i would tell you they all liked my dress very much i was dressed in my yellow coat black bib and apron black feathers on my head my paste comb all my paste garnet marcasset and jet pins together with my silver plume my locket rings black collar round my neck black mitts two or three yards of blue ribbon striped tucker and ruffles and my silk shoes completed my dress it would seem somewhat puzzling to fancy how with a little girl's soft hair the astonishing and varied headgear named above could be attached little anna gives a full description of the way her hair was dressed over a heavy roll so heavy and hot that it made her head quote, itch and ache and burn like anything unquote. She tells of the height of her headgear. Quote, when it first came home, Aunt put it on and my new cap on it. She then took up her apron and measured me, 
and from the roots of my hair on my forehead to the top of my notions i measured above an inch longer than i did downwards from the roots of my hair to the end of my chin Unquote. her picture shown facing page one sixty four is taken from a miniature painted when she was a few years older the roll is more modest in size and the decorations are fewer in number each year the head equipage diminished till cropped heads were seen with a shock of tight curls on the forehead an incredibly disfiguring mode in the chapter upon the school life of girls a letter is given describing the dress of two young girls who were boarding in boston while they were being taught there is no doubt that very rich dress was desired and possibly required of these young scholar boarders the oft-quoted letter in regard to miss huntington's wardrobe shows the elegance of dress of those schoolgirls she had twelve silk gowns but word was sent home to norwich that a recently imported rich fabric was most suitable for her rank and station and in answer to the teacher's request the parents ordered the purchase of this elegant dress when cotton fabrics from oriental countries became everywhere and every time worn children's dress as likewise that of grown folk was much reduced in elegance as it was in warmth hoops disappeared and heavy petticoats also the soft slimsy clinging stuffs suitable only for summer wear were not discarded in winter boys were in nankeen suits the entire year calico and chintz were fashioned into trousers and jackets a little suit is shown facing page sixty made of figured calico of high colors which it is stated was worn in seventeen eighty four the labels are very exact and the labelers very cautious of the deerfield memorial hall collection else i should assign this suit to ten or even twenty years later date children must have suffered sadly with the cold in this age of cotton girls dresses were half low necked and were filled in with a thin tucker separate sleeves were tied in at the arm size and often long arm mitts of nankeen or linen took the place of the sleeves a family of Carey children had several charming portraits painted in london two of them are given opposite pages two hundred forty and two hundred forty six they note the transitions of costume which came at the approach of the close of the century the portrait of the boy is interesting in a special point of costume it shows the abandonment of the cocked hat and the adoption of the simpler modern form of head covering the little girl margaret has a most roguish expression which is suggestive of sir joshua reynolds girl with the mousetrap the resemblance is even more marked in the portrait of the same child at the age of six wherein the eyes and half smile are charmingly engaging unfortunately the photograph from that portrait is not clear enough for satisfactory reproduction a demure little brother and sister were the children of general stephen rowe bradley of westminster vermont whose portraits face pages three hundred fifty six and three hundred seventy eight these were painted soon after the revolution and show the definite changes in dress which set in with other republican institutions at this date there began to be worn a special dress for both boys and girls until then as soon as a boy put on breeches he dressed precisely like his father in miniature 
by tradition marie antoinette was the first who had a special dress made for her young son and sadly was she reviled for dressing her poor little dauphin in jacket and trousers instead of flapped coat waistcoat and knee breeches end of chapter two